Gwendolyn, welcome back to This Is Horror Podcast. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, so last time it had been two years since we'd had you on. This time it's more like one month, one and a yeah. half months. So definitely a quicker yeah. return. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> now, has there been anything that has happened in that month that you wanted to talk about? Any changes, any shifts in dynamic or mindset? <laughs> well, The Haunting of Oakwood came out. So, I mean, I feel like every time you have a new book out, that's like a big shift in the dynamic. You feel very different. It feels like a really different experience, like living with a book and like, you know, it's coming, but like, you don't know what's going to happen or how people are going to react. So that's like a big thing. Once it's out there, you're like, okay, it's out there forever. It's no matter what happens, this, this part of that process is over. So yeah, that's a big thing. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, how have you found the initial reaction? And then what have you been doing in terms of the promotion and getting the word out there? Have you done any in-person events? Has it been restricted to online? Let's talk a little bit about that because last time you were preparing to promote, yes. preparing for the release. And now, as you say, it is here. It is alive. It is. It's alive. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, the reception has been good so far. I've had a lot of, you know, people sharing it on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter anymore, so I don't know anything that's going on in those, those, I'm not on TikTok either, but a lot of good reactions on Instagram and on Facebook, and it's gotten some very nice reviews. There was a great review that came out from Paste that was really nice because I love Paste. And yeah, so that's been really exciting. And I've been doing some in-person events. I've been doing you know, a decent bit of interviews. So we had my launch in Pittsburgh about three weeks ago now. And that was lovely. I did an appearance in Cleveland. I just got back from Atlanta. And so it's been, you know, a lot of just out there talking about the book, talking about my ghosts. <laughs> yeah. And of course, now that I have read it, I mean, firstly, fantastic book, absolutely met if not exceeded my expectations I mean they they were very high to begin with so it, it, it at a minimum met them but so many things that we were talking about before now of course make more sense and you know you spoke about how people had previously compared it to a David Lynch film and of course I think the things that came up the most were Blue Velvet, particularly the mm -hmm. opener. And yeah. indeed, Twin Peaks is an easy comparison because of it being that small town disquieting horror where something deeply wrong is going on. One Lynch film I haven't really heard mentioned, but to me, I can see some commonalities, is Mulholland Drive. Ooh, okay. And so I wondered if that was something you were thinking about while writing. And I, I, I think because as well, there's just so much mystique in both films about identity. There's almost like a kind of love dynamic as well. And like the unreliable, not even necessarily narrator but just unreliability throughout in both of those I love that comparison that makes me so happy you know no I don't think anyone has talked about Mulholland Drive in relation to this book yet but that's actually one of my favorite Lynch films and so that's a really exciting comparison and I really like the idea of like you said about how it is like a very dark love story Mulholland Drive is and this really is in its own way and it, they're both about identity so much so yeah I really love that I love that yeah yeah and I think something that I mean of course you mentioned that in writing this book you became public with your own bisexuality but I feel now having read it that we 
we almost understated just how much this is simultaneously a love story as well as a horror story, but it's also very much dealing with loneliness and lack of acceptance and isolation and even grappling with one's own identity, particularly when, you know, you're not fully out and you you know you, you're kind of like almost one person to the people who know your true identity and one person to others yeah that's a really a really great observation i would very much agree with that it that is very much true in this story of like how talitha in particular the main character yes how the maybe the neighborhood views her and how maybe her best friend brett views her and how those two people are not the same. And, you know, what does that do to us, those fragmented identities? Again, Mulholland Drive is is such a great example of those kind of fragmented identities. And so, yeah, that's that's very, very true of this book. Absolutely. And I think, too, I mean, in terms of ghosts and hauntings, there's almost this idea that we're, we can be haunted by time but in such a way that that there's almost like a crossover of time travel and hauntings and they kind of fuse together as one and so I mean how much do you think one can be haunted by time and how much do you feel in in kind of a way in being haunted that we can almost time travel and I know some some listeners might be like what what it has has Michael lost it or, but I I feel that sometimes in in fixating on something there is a kind of time travel that we can partake yes. in mm-hmm. yes and that was very much something I was thinking about about how much grief and trauma are are things that actually put us in these time loops that it's like suddenly you're a time traveler and you're going back in time and you're living you're you feel like you're you're living in that moment you'll have all the same emotions your body will physically feel the same way it did in this moment of grief or in this moment of trauma and so i i think about that a lot and i was definitely thinking about that as i was writing this book about about this haunted neighborhood that they can literally walk back into the people who can, the three girls who escaped it. And I love that haunted by time, because I think a lot of us are, we're haunted by something that either. And and also I I talk a lot about trauma and grief. Sometimes, you know, it's things that were good and positive and you can't get back to because, you know, one of the characters within Velkwood really wants to, she didn't have as bad of an experience as, as the other two characters. And so people can have very different experiences of the same time in the same place. And some people might look back on it as like, oh, I miss this time and I want to go back to it. And other people are like, I keep going back to it in my mind because it was so traumatizing. So those different kinds of experiences with time and how we how we deal with that. Yeah, are there any moments in time that you would like to go back to? If we lived in this kind of world where perhaps we could have a vacation to a different time in our lives. No, no, I, I'm definitely somebody, I just want to move forward. I want to move forward. Sometimes I feel like I'm stuck too much in those kind of time loops of trying to figure out the past and trying to understand how did I end up here? I want to look much more to the future. That's like what I'm always trying to do. So no, I don't want to go back. I go back too much. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's probably a healthy way to go about it, to be honest, because, yeah, if we fixate too much on the past, then we might miss what's going on in the present and what potential opportunities await us in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, something that you mentioned last time we spoke was that it was actually while you were writing this book that you realized you were writing about your sexuality. So you didn't start off intentionally doing that. So I wonder at what point in the process did you realize that you were writing about your sexuality and then how did that change the writing process? 
You know, I don't know that it really changed it that much because it was it almost felt like it was like a locomotive at that point that it was already moving in that direction and that I was just like, okay, I'm going to keep going. I would say about a third of the way through, a quarter to a third of the way through, you know, it was far enough in that I couldn't back out of it as much as I wanted to. So I know it was definitely a significant, it wasn't like a chapter because I could have backed out at a chapter. So I think it was about a third of the way through, like probably about 25,000 words. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like I really did this to myself. So yeah. <laughs> so do you think if you had realized even earlier, so let's say a chapter, do you think you would have backed out? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I was not at a place that I wanted to deal with us at all. Like not publicly anyways, even though Honestly, looking back, so much of so much of my work has queer female characters anyway. So it's not to everyone else, it's not a big surprise. This wasn't like something that was like I always find it interesting that other people often can see the things in you before you can sometimes, like especially things you don't want to deal with. Other people are like, yeah, like of course. And you're the last one that's like, okay, I'm gonna tell you guys the secret. And everybody's like, it wasn't a secret, but okay, that's nice, you know. But I, yeah, I would have definitely backed out of writing. I'm glad now that I didn't, but it definitely shifted my world in a lot of ways. I'm being like, okay, now I have to deal with this. So yeah, <laughs> writing, yeah. it's such a process. Right, yeah, yeah. And I mean, much like when you publicly came out, you felt free to talk more about your sexuality. Now that you have written a story that I mean could be classified as a queer story there are definitely queer elements mm. strong queer elements within the story do you feel a kind of liberation or like you would like to write more queer stories or a freedom to explore that side in your fiction a lot of queer characters in my work. So in some ways it hasn't changed that much, but in other ways I feel like it's changed so much because it's like before it was like, okay, I'm doing this, I'm writing these characters, but I'm not publicly out and I'm not necessarily commenting on the fact that I'm doing this and I'm not kind of promo like promoting the, the stories to that audience, which I always felt was a missed opportunity in retrospect because that could be an audience that, you know, these stories could resonate with. So yeah, so it both I'm both writing in a lot of the same ways, but at the same time not because I feel more comfortable with it and more like, okay, this is all right. This is fine. You know, I don't have to be worried about it or looking over my shoulder over what. I don't know. It's always weird, these things that we kind of get hung up on, even if there are reasons from the past, because at a certain point, it's like those reasons don't exist anymore. We're not stuck in the ghostly neighborhood. We have moved forward. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's both the same and completely different. It's really weird. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, of course, you said that following on from this, that you spoke at StokerCon on a bisexuality in horror panel. Now, we, we didn't actually talk at length about this. But again, like a lot of this conversation, I want to follow up on the things that I didn't follow up on <laughs> before. So I want to know a little bit about not only what that experience was like, but perhaps what some of the takeaways from that panel were. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to think back now because it's been almost a year. I want to make sure I do it justice. So, you know, it was it was a good experience. I was the moderator. It was the panel that I pitched and everything. So it was really exciting to, you know, when I realized and I went back and sort of looked, have there been any panels like this anywhere else at any other conference? And there hadn't been. And so I'm like, this is really good. Like, it made me feel like, okay, you know, I may have waited until I was in my 30s to come out publicly, but this is an opportunity to do something that's never been done. So I put together a panel that was a, a great, a great group of, of writers. Want to make sure I get everybody. So I'm actually going to stop real quick and I'm going to actually look up bisexuality and horror panel because I know at the very least my I want to get everybody's name because like at, at the moment I'm like, am I going to forget somebody and then I'm going to feel terrible if I forget someone? All right, so uh, it was J.A.W. McCarthy, K.P. Kolsky, Eric Raglan, and Angela Sylvain were on the panel with me. 
I think I would have remembered everybody, but I'm still glad I looked it up just in case. And so, you know, it was, they're all, they're all four incredible writers. So that was a lot of fun just to hang out with them and talk about horror with them. And one of the things that really stuck with me is I asked, cause I realized I'd never used the word bisexuality in my fiction before. And it bothered me because I felt like, you know, we talk a lot about bi invisibility and the way that, you know, bisexuality can kind of be deleted that you'll either call, you know, gay or straight rather than being, you know, a unique identity. But I realized even I'm not using the word. So I remember asking the panelists and all of them said, I don't think I've ever used the word in my writing either. And that was really interesting to me. And it's something that I'm trying to think more about when I'm writing of making sure to use that word to make sure that that is, you know, I would ideally like to live in a world where it's not a big deal that we don't have to put labels. Cause I understand that some people push back about not wanting labels and I get that. I understand that. But at the same time, I feel like we're still at a place that things can be deleted or identities can be misunderstood. And sometimes being very overt of like, okay, this character identifies as bisexual. It's not just that they're dating, you know, male and female characters or non-binary characters because bisexuality is usually these days, anyways, the definition that I use and other people use is uh, attraction to two or more genders. So that way it's not just on a gender binary of just male and female, because obviously we, we live in a much bigger world than just that. So, you know, really trying to make those things overt within the text. And so that was something I really took away from that conversation about being like, okay, I really want to use use that word more often and that way it's more visible and it's, you know, because even with Velkwood, I think some people have said that these characters are lesbian characters and I, they're not represented that way and that's not how I see them. And obviously we need lesbian characters too. There's, they, you know, we need all of these types of characters, but I do think it's important, you know, to to be a little bit more explicit and and I didn't use the word bisexuality in The Haunting of Velkwood, but I'm, I'm definitely going to continue trying to find ways to, to work Work it in without it being something of like, oh, there's Gwendolyn definitely using the word bisexual, like she said in that interview. So that's like the kind of challenge of where do you find that moment to be able to kind of work it in that it feels organic to the story. Yeah, yeah. I think that is the challenge, doing it organically, because mm-hmm. I think any gender, any sexuality, how do you explicitly you know, state that in fiction yeah. without it seeming a little bit shoehorned. And, yeah. you know, that mm-hmm. there's, there will be moments, but it's finding, okay, what is that real moment to be able yeah. to put that in? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So that's, that's like an interesting challenge as I'm like working through, like I'm working on a project now that I'm like, I know I want to say this word at some point, but I need to make sure that it's not just like kind of forced in there. So, but hey, that's, that's why we do this, right? To try to fit, solve those problems, all the problems of writing and figuring out what are those right moments for everything, every plot beat, everything. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the only place you could absolutely put it in organically without it seeming shoehorned would be in like marketing, in blurbs, in yes. that mm-hmm. kind of material yes. because, yes. you know, th- this is a place really where we are stating what the story is and what exactly. it's about. So mm-hmm. that's, even if it's not in the actual text, the yeah. main text, you could put it in the book at least or on the book. That's a that's a really good point. That's a good point because that's a way that it's still like on the book and it's still very directly connected to the book. That's a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree with you too that I wish that we lived in a world where we almost didn't need to have any of these labels because you know love is love it's yep. it, it should be as simple as that it yeah. really should yeah absolutely absolutely so I definitely understand that you know when people are like I don't want to be labeled and I'm like I get it I do I do so whenever people are like push back against labels I'm like I understand and for a long time I I really wanted to too but sometimes it was also me hiding and not wanting to deal with things as well I think I used to go with the idea of like oh everybody's bisexual and that's like such a sign that it's like no not everybody is (laughs) it just might be that you are (laughs) right yeah yeah and I mean we're we're kind of both in terms of what we're talking about 
here with bisexuality, but also as a wider theme in the book. We're talking about community and we're talking about pockets of communities. We're talking about community within communities. So I'm wondering, what does community mean to you? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. I mean, I feel like community should hopefully be a place of belonging and a place that you feel safe. I think ideally community is a place that you feel safe, that it's people and a, you know, probably people you feel safe with because you can say the horror community and that's not necessarily a place. Sometimes a bunch of people come together in one place, whether it's a virtual space like social media or, you know, a physical place like a convention. But like, I think a community should ideally be somewhere you feel safe. It isn't always, I suppose you can still call it a community even if you don't feel safe there. But I think for me, the ideal the ideal for a community is a place that you feel safe, a place you feel like you belong and, and you feel like you have other people there that understand you. And so on that note, what communities do you feel part of or which communities do you most strongly identify with yeah yeah you know the horror community I do feel like you know I've I've made a lot of great friends and I I hope I'm a good friend to a lot of people within the horror community and obviously the horror community isn't a monolith there's a lot of different aspects of it and different kind of cliques and things like that um, but I'm, I'm also happy we have a good group of horror writers here in Pittsburgh and that's really nice. So it's like, you know, not only is there the kind of online community, there are some of us that do, you know, get together in person and go out and, you know, do horror related things. So that's really nice. That's like a, that can, that's both a feeling and then also, you know, a place, like I said, that, that, that we are, and we go out to and things like that. So that's definitely a community I feel like I, I'm part of. And I do feel like, you know, in, in the community in, in Pittsburgh, uh, the queer community, I feel, you know, I, I go out and do some events within within the queer community, the LGBTQ plus community in Pittsburgh. So that's really good. And that that's really positive. So I think those are like the two, the two really big ones for me are, are those two communities. So that's positive. Yeah, what kind of events are being put on by the queer community in Pittsburgh? You know, there's like different groups, you know, coming together. There's queer women's groups. There's also like, there's a uh, witchy LGBTQ friendly bar in Pittsburgh, which is like the best because I also practice witchcraft. So it's like, you know, there's a lot of queer witches out there, which is fabulous. And also like kind of, it's like a sense of belonging. So yeah. And then I also put on like a monthly uh, queer film club, but we actually are doing one tomorrow. And so that's actually a really fun thing just to go and talk about movies that have like LGBTQ characters or are made by LGBTQ creators. So that's, that's a good, that's a good one. We're doing Bound tomorrow, which I love it by like the first film from the Wachowskis before they did the Matrix. And I love that movie. It's a great one. So I'm very excited to talk to people everybody about it the first movie we did was the hunger which was fun because like horror and everything i want to do more horror but i don't want to scare everyone away so i'm always like working it in sometimes (laughs) it's so interesting that you mentioned bound because i would say in the what 11 years of this is horror podcast nobody had mentioned bound until about a week ago when we spoke with samantha allen because Samantha Allen, she got a blurb from Lily Wachowski for <laughs> her book. Wow. And then Lily actually sent Samantha a prop from the movie Bound. So, yeah, 11 years and it's not been mentioned at all. And now two episodes in a row. So I love that. Do I you love- know what the prop was? What was the prop? Now I want to know what the prop was. <sighs> I I need to re-listen. I I I think um goodness it, it it's escaping me now but I I will find out and I will let you know but it yeah it is most treasured by Samantha and That is amazing. Like, if you that. haven't read any Samantha Allen then you absolutely should check out Patricia Wants to Cuddle. Okay. Okay. It's right. kind of got like um 
a Sasquatch monster theme mixed okay. with reality TV shows I've like The Bachelor. Like, is that the one with like the like animal on the cover or something? Like, okay, yes, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's so good, and Samantha is such a generous, kind-hearted person. So you you got to check it out, and if you do a queer book club, well that book is absolutely you know it would fit in perfectly to that i love that i love that like two like two episodes almost in a row right like mentioned bound that's amazing that's, that's yeah terrific. yeah <laughs> and you know in in terms of the horror community i did put on social media that we were chatting with you and I say we, Bob is not here right now. <laughs> I, I forget some of them. No, it's, it's just me for <laughs> for now. There are not two of me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Neil McRobert of Talking Scared, he said he would like me to ask you if your dad has changed his mind about Velkwood. So, obviously, I'm going to need some context for this. Because I don't know what your dad thought about Velcwood to begin with. So <laughs> let's begin he there. He is not a fan. He is not a fan of Velcwood because the he thinks everybody is so mean in it. And he thinks the dads are really terrible. And he's scared that everyone is going to think that he was like, like Brett's dad. And I'm like, no, dad, no one's going to think that. But the answer, Neil, sadly, is no. He has not changed his opinion on the book. But he did call me today to ask me how the book tour is going. So he is he is supporting the book in his own way, <laughs> even if he is not a fan of it. <laughs> so is the, the main reason why he is not a fan simply because he fears that all the dads are mean and now people will... <laughs> think he is mean too is that ultimately I, I what think, it comes down to I think it's the, the the bulk of it is yes i think so and i'm like dad it's it, there are ghosts too it's obviously not pure memoir yeah <laughs> yeah oh dear well i don't know it just ma it makes it more interesting if the parents are not ideal figures i mean goodness like Eric LaRocca he has such a good relationship with his parents but if you were to take his fiction as being some sort of memoir it's like he writes about the most awful parents you could have yeah I mean you know obviously we're, we're taking some some creative liberties right like it's not uh again we're not writing memoir it's not autobiography not completely anyways there's certainly yeah. some of that in there I think for all of us but yeah <laughs> oh yeah and I mean like as you were saying before or at least alluding to I mean you can think that you're writing pure fiction and then when you read it back you're like oh my god there's so much of me going into this there's so much autobiography in this story yeah yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, that that creeps in a lot and like themes and things like that, especially, I think that we start kind of gearing ourselves toward that, even if we don't mean to. I do think that's true. Now, something you mentioned that I can't believe having had multiple conversations that we've never really spoke about this, but you spoke about practicing witchcraft. Oh, yeah. So I want to know what that looks like for you, what kind of things you're doing and how that wraps up in terms of coming into your identity. And I, I, I suppose as well, because like, you know, saying you practice witchcraft is such a broad thing. It's almost like yeah. saying I'm a member of a religion or, you know, or, or I like food. It's like, well, tell me <laughs> the variety. What yeah. is it that you're doing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, it's a lot of it's Wiccan. I mean, I would say Wiccan broadly defined, but, you know, not anything so specific. Uh, do a lot with tarot. I love tarot. I mean, I think tarot is such an interesting thing. It can be so interesting for creativity too, you know, just like doing spreads and interpreting them. And there's such a creativity involved in that. 
you know, I do some work with herbs and crystals. I love crystals. I know that some like crystals, I feel like have like this bad reputation for being like too like hippy dippy. But I, I mean, if nothing else, they're pretty. It's fun to just have pretty stones sitting around. Uh, I'm like looking over I do some things with sound. I'm looking at my altar. It's like sits right next to my, to my desk. Um, but yeah, like a lot of things like that. So, you know, do some spell work, but a lot of it's just, I like the idea of intention setting. I think that that can be really nice, especially from a creative standpoint of like, here's my intention. I'm going to do a spell, put together herbs or crystals or a tarot card that represents that and then focus on that. And then to me, so much of manifestation is about the work you do from there. It's not necessarily, this is supernatural. And that's why I got this story done. Sometimes it's just a matter of kind of directing your energy in a way that you're just paying attention to something and really trying to be like, okay, what do I want? Because that's a big thing, like, you know, trying to figure out what is it that I want? What, what, are, what is my goal here? And just defining that and using witchcraft as kind of a vehicle for doing that can help make something real. So things like that. That's like really kind of the, the bulk of what, of what I do. You know, today we were my, cause my husband practices witchcraft as well. And we were like watching this really fun rabbit lore uh, video. Like they were doing it through zoom, uh, this circle sanctuary. And it was really fun. It was so much fun. Like learning about like symbolism throughout history of rabbits in different cultures and things like that. And then we did like a rabbit meditation where you imagined yourself as like a rabbit and having the energy of a rabbit. And I love that stuff. Cause I think it's fun. I think it like, challenges you to think in a different way. Like if I was just sitting here, I would never by myself be like, I'm going to think about being a rabbit now. But like you're in this group and like everybody's talking about like, you know, the symbolism of rabbits and in folklore and things like that. And then it's like, okay, let's do this meditation. I'm like, this is great. Like this is fun. Sometimes it can be cool because I think witchcraft can actually have crafts in it. That's one of my favorite things too about witchcraft is I've gone to actual witchcraft stores and you'll actually make little crafts and like put your intention in. And I'm like, there's actual craft in witchcraft. So it's just like fun things that kind of almost take you back to childhood. Cause most of the time we don't have like reasons to do like fun little crafty things like that. So I think it's just cool just doing that. And in terms of how it's playing out in your life, is it more ritualistic more about intention setting more about these activities or is, is there a supernatural component is there almost another worldly component i mean i'm okay if there's not a supernatural component but there's definitely weird things that can happen so i think was on Neil's show the last time talking scared he asked about like a weird thing that happened and I talked about how I we live at a crossroads and I went and I made an offering one night to the goddess Hecate because she works at crossroads and my husband was standing back and he said that like this car went by and after it had gone by like I just like disappeared for a minute I was like making this this uh this offering and he said I just completely disappeared and he's like staring where I was and I'm just not there and then all of a sudden right in front of him I just emerged from a shadow and he's just like whoa like he's like he was like really freaked out and like he is not an easily rattled dude but he's like you just completely disappeared and then just reappeared out of nowhere and so I mean you know Obviously, there's like, like everyday ways like, oh, the eyes play tricks on you. But I mean, you know, the fact that I was making an offering to a goddess of the crossroads at a crossroads, and I disappeared for a second, you know, according to my not easily rattled husband, I do find that like, you know, it's interesting, at the very least, I'll say that. So <laughs> yeah, there's often a human explanation that we can give but it is interesting to have that but what if the truth is the supernatural explanation yeah. like that makes the world a more exciting place that what if about it. Like, even if there's no supernatural, I feel like just leaving the door open to the possibility makes the world so much more interesting. So I just like to leave the door open. Even if it's just a crack open, like, that's fine. Like, I'm, I'm leaving the door open for those things. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other 
kind of disquieting or strange moments that you could tell me about that you know you didn't mention previously and I know that we have spoke about hauntings and things before so yeah I may be asking you to dig deep here I know I'm trying to think if there was anything there was another time my husband and I were doing a spell and like we're doing this spell and it felt like there was like real energy in the room we both really felt it and like our one cat just starts kind of freaking out and I think like this is gross to say but she like just like she's not she she does not have a bad stomach but she just like threw up randomly and then outside all of a sudden there was like lightning and like a tree like fell right across the street all at the same time and it's like whoa like again could just be a coincidence right but it was like all these things it was like there was so much energy and the cat is freaking out and like trees are crashing and it's like a storm's out of nowhere and it's like I mean it would look it'd be great in a movie right it like it's very cinematic so I mean that was interesting that was a weird thing <laughs> so, I mean it begs the question really what was the spell that you were doing at the time you know what was the spell I actually remember that more I think I was just what was it like talking to a past self I think and I I believe if I am if I'm accurate on this I believe I actually like I think we were even using like our our spirit board and I was talking to someone and I I would have been, I would have had older siblings, but my, my parents had several miscarriages. And I actually wondered based on what was being said, if it was like the Gwendolyn that would have been Gwendolyn, like the, the older sibling that probably would have gotten my name. And that was like what they were saying on, on, on the spirit board. So maybe like an older sibling that wasn't born. So, I mean, it was a pretty powerful thing. Like it was a really... Uh, that wasn't necessarily what I was looking to talk to, but I, that was what seemed like happened. And so, yeah, so that was interesting. That was interesting. So it was a very powerful experience with that. And then with everything happening around us. Yeah. And what you've described it, as you say, it is very cinematic. I mean, that is how a spell is cast in the movies and then it's actually <laughs> happening in your house. I know. Cause there's like wow that seems very on the nose like if I wrote that in a book people would be like that's ridiculous and I'm like it kind of is but it did happen <laughs> yeah yeah and you know back to Velkwood I mean it, this is not a book for people who want easy answers and things to be tied up in a neat little bow I mean not only is there ambiguity in the ending, but there is, I would argue, ambiguity in terms of how you interpret the entire story. There are so many things where there are double meanings or there are double interpretations. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I imagine that must have been something you were very conscious of, mm -hmm. but when it comes to writing your fiction I mean how concerned are you in terms of giving answers in terms of leaving things to interpretation is your answer different to your editor does your editor want you to give more answers oh that that's a good question I don't think so I I I'm trying to think back to the editing process I don't actually think that that was a, a big part of it maybe there was a little bit that my editor said, can you just give us a little bit? I think more about the character of Enid. Could you just build her up a little bit more? And I was good with that because like I could have spent, I could have written a whole book about her character. I love her character. She's just a very interesting person kind of left behind in, in the neighborhood. And so maybe a little bit more about her, but not too much about having to actually give really concrete answers, which I was grateful about because I like leaving things open-ended. I like the idea that there's multiple interpretations for, for stories or, or for films. I always like that idea that you can kind of debate it. You know, one of the things that has come up is, are they even ghosts? Is that what's happening here? Like, I know some people are like, are they definitely ghosts? And I'm like, I mean, 
That's up to somebody to interpret. I consider that they're ghosts, but I don't necessarily consider that they're a kind of typical quote unquote ghost. And so like, but I'm, I'm good with however people kind of interpret it. I actually like, I, I like ambiguity, at least a little bit of ambiguity that you can just kind of follow that idea of what you think happened rather than it being like, I always think it's weird when writers are like, no, there's one answer to my work. And I'm like, I would think you'd really want there to be maybe more than one, because like, if there's only one, I always make the joke that it's like C-Spot Run. Like, you know, it's so just straightforward and there's nothing wrong with C-Spot Run, obviously, but it, it is for children. The, the, the reason that it's so straightforward is that it's for kids. You know, I like the idea of leaving things at least a little open-ended. I feel like for adult readers, like, you know, we're adults, we can figure things out, you know, how we how we see it. And I like that. I think as well, ambiguity and multiple interpretation is more honest to real life. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything mm -hmm. that happens, there mm -hmm. are going to be multiple sides or perspectives. And, you know, be because there are different people, there are different interpretations. So it it seems silly to say that there's just one answer. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I feel like in life, you don't usually get easy answers. And so when fiction feels too easy, when it feels too straightforward to me, I'm like, it, it lacks that kind of reality. It lacks that, you know, what I feel our experiences are. Because I completely agree with you. Even two people who have the same they're at the same place at the same time, don't have the same experience or interpretation of something. So if a book can only have one interpretation, which I don't think there's any book that out there that really does, whether the author wants to believe that or not. But I think that, you know, we do all see things so differently. So anything is going to have those multiple perspectives with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I know... Last time you told us that you were working on another two releases, you you know, your next two releases, one is going to be more historical, one is going to be more in the modern day. Mm. I'm wondering just from a kind of author perspective, what is it like for you being on this promotional tour for Velkwood, but in terms of the creative Mm -hmm. mindset you know you're you're working on a different book you know it is always interesting because I feel like especially even even with small press you're usually six months to a year out but then with you know big four presses you're often two years out and so it's you know or at least a year and a half usually so it is interesting to have something have been so long in the past it's almost like all books are ghosts to the authors at that point right they're in the past and so I think that that is a really interesting experience and in being like well where was I a year and a half ago versus where am I now and yeah. And also I feel like it takes a lot to really properly promote a book. So it's sometimes hard to toggle between that creative process, which I feel like uses a very different part of the mind than a kind of, you know, going out and talking to people and, and that sort of more social aspect that that's much more extroverted. So that that's always an interesting thing. I always feel like when you're busy promoting a book that any writing you get done is like a small miracle unto itself because you're you're thinking so much more about the book that just came out as opposed to maybe the books that you will hopefully have coming out one day. Right. And are you working on one of those two titles that I just mentioned or is there another layer of disconnect where you're actually working on a third book and have written both of those already? No, those are not done. Nothing has been completed yet. But I actually, I think since, since we talked, I actually think I did start a different project and I'm actually working on that more now. I just haven't finished anything yet. I'm still trying to. I'm like, I really need to finish something because I haven't finished a book since Velkwood and that was like a year and a half ago. So I'm like, I need, I've, I've written a lot of short fiction a lot of short nonfiction. I've been writing a lot, but I haven't written a book yet since then. So I'm like, I really want to write a book and have a book done so that I can be like, Velkwood isn't the last thing I finished. Because that it is weird to have a book out and be like, I haven't even finished another book since then. So yeah, goals. Goals for the next few months. Goals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when there's 
quite a time between having finished a book. I mean, th- does that affect you in a negative way or is it kind of okay for your mindset because you're writing a number of short stories and you have so much in the works? Does that keep you going? Because I know that different writers have different feelings on this topic. And for some people, if they have not finished a kind of novel length work in in some time, then they almost get a little bit twitchy or <laughs> Or, or, or like you know it, uncomfortable and they mm-hmm. start doubting and they're like oh god I, I, I hope I can still do this <laughs> you know I mean I I'm fairly sure I can still do it I've, I always tell myself I've done it several times before I think I'll be able to do it again but it is always that thing of like you know what if that's the last book or what if that's the last book that comes out you know it's I, I'm I'm fairly confident I'll have something done. I'm actually fairly confident that this one is going to be done like fairly soon. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Got to do yeah. some witchcraft to get this thing done. <laughs> there you go. Let's just hope that your poor cat does not suffer the consequences. And... I know, poor cat. <laughs> yeah, some projectile vomit for the cause for the Real fiction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, so th- this book then that you've nearly finished so this is a different book are you able to say anything about this one or is it a secret I'm, book I'm not gonna say anything about yeah. it because I'm so worried that it's gonna dissolve like I feel like it's like it's like the little mermaid and she turned they say mermaids turn into sea foam and dissolve I don't want it mm. to turn into mermaid sea foam so I'm gonna keep it under wraps for now so, but hopefully hopefully I'll be able to announce something soon at least that I have a book done. I think I'll at least announce that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I look forward to that <laughs> announcement. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, the announcement might be on Instagram, as we said before. That is your primary social media platform at the moment. Yeah, it really is. That and I do still use Facebook. I, I Facebook just feels like it just keeps humming along at exactly the same level it's always been. And I was I even happened to see this thing about like user engagement and like Twitter has fallen horribly in a year and like, you know. I think even TikTok fell a little bit. And then there's Facebook that's like lower than the other ones, but completely stable. Like, I feel like everybody who's on Facebook is probably there for the long haul, unless like something goes Elon Musk on on Facebook, you know, but it is interesting. It, it, I don't know how much it's good for promoting. I think Twitter was better for promoting and like reaching readers than Facebook is, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not as social media savvy as some people, so... Yeah, it's interesting what you say about Facebook because, I mean, I felt about five years ago it was going the way of MySpace because Mm -hmm. there was quite a dip Mm -hmm. in engagement and it looked like, okay, this is not going to be around for much longer. But like you said, it did dip. But then it just kept at that level. It didn't dip any further. So Yeah, it's actually because, yeah, it did seem about five years ago, like, okay, Twitter's going to take over and, and Facebook's going to be gone. And it definitely is, like, lower than a lot of them, but it's just kind of, like you said, just stayed completely flat. I don't know. Social yeah. media is weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, g- given the volatile nature of so many networks, I mean... Is not what I would have predicted. I'm not even sure it is what I am predicting, but I could see a possibility that if the if the other networks were to cease to exist, then you could almost see people returning to Facebook. And <laughs> it's like, wow, the, the second coming of Facebook. Yeah, and you know, Facebook is almost exactly the same interface that it was five or 10 or 15 years ago. It doesn't look a lot different. They they don't change a lot. It's a very, it it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And honestly, I, I actually like that because, you know, Twitter changed too much, especially by the end. So it's like, sometimes it's nice to be like, it's not great, but at least it's predictable. There is something to be said for that. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, Zuckerberg is being pretty smart about things because he obviously bought Instagram and, you know, then Fred's turned up. So he's like, well, if Facebook doesn't exist, I got Mm -hmm. a few other social networks in my pocket. 
Yeah. Oh, and that's right. Like I had always said, I didn't love the fact that my two social medias were Facebook and Instagram because they're owned by the same company. And that's right. For like two or three hours on the day of my book release, both went down. They were both just down. And I'm like, yeah. And I said to my husband, I'm like, this is exactly why I didn't want it on the same platform because like they both went down at, the, at about the same time. They came back up. It ended up being fine. But I'd forgotten that till just now because I always said like it's not great because if, if the server goes down for one, the server might go down for the other and then you have no access to social media. Because I even messaged somebody I knew who's I think only on Facebook and, and Instagram and I'm like, are your accounts down? And she's like, yeah, my accounts are down too. And I'm like, okay, at least it's not just me, but that's still not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... Fingers crossed that that does not happen with the next release. I mean, very unfortunate timing. It's like you could have chose any day, any time, but you had to choose the time when I was releasing a book. Right, right. I was actually really proud of myself. Like I was writing that day. Like I was actually working on writing on the day the book came out and I like finished I actually finished a chapter in each of my two projects, which I don't think I've ever had a day that I actually finished a chapter in two different projects. And I'm like, so I just worked through that. I'm like, I'm not going to like have a panic attack that my social media is down. I'm just going to get back to writing. So like good for me for having good coping uh, skills that day. It's not every day, but at least it was that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> certainly. And I mean, we spoke before about some of the people who might enjoy Velkwood, some of the themes within, but I wonder, are there any people who you might not necessarily think would gravitate towards Velkwood, but in fact you would recommend it to? So kind of like here's an outsider theme or mm. here are some people that perhaps even in the early feedback have took note of it that you didn't expect to I don't think I never know how a book is going to do right so I'm like always I I tend to be pretty pleasantly surprised all the time because I I usually set my expectations pretty low so that way you're less likely to be disappointed so it's like you know I've I've been happy overall with with the feedback like most a, a, a good portion of it has been very positive I've been very happy in general I mean you know nobody there's no book that everybody likes. So that's just part of the job. You know, that's just what, that's just what goes with the territory. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people, horror fans, you know, have seemed to really resonate with it. People who, you know, like to read queer horror or queer fiction, ghost stories, I'm trying to think of like, you know, one thing that has come up that I'm actually happy about because I've never had a book that anybody has described this way science fiction there, there there are some science fiction elements in the book and that's come up for some people that really like that and comparisons to the x-files have come up even though i don't think i really don't remember even thinking about the x-files explicitly when i was writing it but i was a big fan of the x-files growing up so that was neat that was not a group of people that i was like oh x-files fans but yeah i could see that because there is this kind of like it's a spooky occurrence and people are investigating and i'm trying to figure it out and so that was neat. That's been really cool because I don't think I've ever had a book that somebody's like, oh, this is science fiction or this has science fiction elements. And so that's cool because I, I love horror sci-fi. I think that's great. Like Aliens is one of the first films I ever saw as a little kid. So like I loved it so much. And so that's definitely like sci-fi horror. So that's cool. I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah, I certainly did think that there were some sci-fi elements, particularly because of the strange way in which time is treated mm -hmm. and there is this mm -hmm. time travel there is this haunting of time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know one one hour somewhere could be mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. number of months somewhere else mm -hmm. you know one thing after reading it like i realized oh this is actually difficult to talk about with specifics without spoiling the whole thing because I mean, so much like a David Lynch film is in kind of experiencing it cold and adding your own kind of spin, your own mm -hmm. interpretation mm -hmm. onto it. So mm -hmm. like 
Ironically, despite the fact that we've kind of spoke about this for three episodes, it is quite difficult to talk about. <laughs> there are things that, yeah, do spoil it if, if, you know, if you say too much. But, you know, I don't personally mind spoilers, but definitely some people do. So I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess different listeners are going to be in for different things. For for me, when I come into something, I try to come into it as cold as possible to just see what happens. Like, sometimes I'll read something or watch something. I don't even know what the genre is. So <laughs> sometimes I'll be surprised if it starts off like it's one genre and then, oh, oh, we t- took a dark turn. Great, <laughs> I'm even more in for this now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what is it that you're watching and reading at the moment? Oh, what have I been watching and reading? I'm trying to think. People always ask me this, and I always blank out on what I've been watching and reading. Like, <sighs> I can't believe I can't come up with anything. Like, I, I've definitely been reading a whole bunch of different, like, works. And maybe that's it. I've been kind of dipping in and out of a lot of things, so it's like I can't think of any good recommendations right now like what is like I'm I'm always trying to think of like cool horror to recommend to people the problem also is I write a lot of lists so I just did an early so I can say this even though I didn't necessarily just watch these but I just did an article on early slasher movies like that influenced the genre and so like I was talking about of an old Val Luton movie called The Leopard Man that a lot of people don't seem to talk about, Peeping Tom, which is sort of like Psycho before Psycho was released, and um, an old pre-code horror movie called 13 Women, which is very dated in a lot of ways, but it is sort of like one of the first films to actually kind of have that idea that there's a killer stalking people like one by one throughout the throughout the story and they're trying to figure it out like the way they do in a slasher movie so like those ones are the ones that are on my mind right now but I didn't just watch them but they're like making it so those are the only films I can think of right now (laughs) yeah yeah and I totally understand in terms of like reading multiple books yeah at once and so yeah, it can be if someone's like, what are you reading? It's almost like, goodness, what what am I not reading? There's so many <laughs> things that I'm reading right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah, then it then it can make it difficult for kind of saying what is the the dominant book that I'm reading. But I I think I've been really fortunate at the moment like I'm in such a kind of happy spell of just quality books obviously I've read The Haunting of Velkwood but I read The Reformatory by Tanana Reeve Du Mm -hmm. which is absolutely amazing Mm -hmm. I read Eric LaRocca's most recent collection and honestly the one he put out before for me was a best of year candidate so I was a little bit nervous to read the next one it's like how can you better it and it's like well by god he did (laughs) it's so good (laughs) and you know um Kev Harrison's got a novel out which is very very good as well that one is set in Tunisia and I think Turkey as well it's going all over Europe that one it's a very very good story and of course I mentioned Samantha Allen um I'm I'm reading Bella Mackey's How to Kill Your Family so there's so many good things that I'm reading at the moment some current some from a few years back very cool. Very cool. I do feel like we have an embarrassment of riches in terms of the horror genre right now. There's so much good stuff out there. It's just so many great books to read. So little time too, but so many great books. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's it. It is a good problem to have all considered. And I mean, you mentioned before writing the article about the slashes and Max Booth wanted me to just like mention and thank you for all that incredible work you do. <clears throat> all that incredible work you do rounding up the open calls and the submissions. I know that I mentioned it 
to you before, but this is uh, specifically from Max Booth. So Aww. now you've got the thank you from him too. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Max. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, I wonder what are some of the biggest struggles that you have battled with recently and how did you go about overcoming or navigating them? Ooh, that's a that's a big question. Um, what are the biggest struggles? You know, finding enough time for everything, I feel like is a really big one. I'm not always great on time management. And so like really trying to find time to make sure that I write, make sure also I know it's like a buzzword and it's almost like cliched, but self-care is a real thing that we all need. And also making sure that we make time for that, whatever that looks like for each of us, because obviously self-care isn't the same for every person. Some people run and that's their self-care. I hate running. I do not like running. That would not be self-care for me, but it is for some people. And so it's like figuring out to make some time just to do something that can help you decompress and everything. And, and, you know, rebuild that energy, get enough sleep, make sure I get enough sleep, eat healthy. A lot of the basic stuff, like sometimes I always say I'm not that great at being an adult. Like I'm not always good at being able to be like, okay, now I need to eat healthy. Now I need to, you know, brush my teeth and go to bed. I'm like, you know, crash rather than, you know, do the good self care. So trying to do that. That's always a big, that's always a big thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I guess the caveat is finding the self care that works for you. Because like mm -hmm. you say, like, I mean, for, for me, running is not a thing either. For fellow podcaster, Neil McRobert, for some reason, he likes to do he that. I... Yeah, and honestly, I almost <laughs> gave a shout out to him because I was like, I know he always posts like running, he loves it. But I'm like, that looks terrible. But he, you know, and I have friends that run and they love it. And I, I get it. I do understand. Like, there's like a lot of endorphins that you get from running. That's that does sound great. But like, I try running and it makes me very unhappy. Yeah, I I prefer walking relatively quickly, <laughs> you know, w walking quickly around the block or hiking and maybe listening to a good audio book. That is a much better, you know, high for me. And then when it comes to exercise, more like body weight or lifting weights, but I don't need running. <laughs> I don't need that in my life. You know, the only time I run is if I'm late for a bus and then, okay, now we've got a purpose <laughs> yeah. but running yeah. in and of itself. We'll leave that to Neil. <laughs> yes. yes. He runs enough for all of us. He does. He does. Thank you, Neil. You do the yeah. running for the both of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, before we close this episode, did you have any final things that you wanted to say about Velkwood? Did you have any final requests for the audience? No, just like if you like ghost stories, if you like queer horror, if you like sci-fi horror, apparently, like I, I, that works too. You know, just consider picking up a copy of Velkwood. If you've read it, like leave a review and just keep reading queer horror, keep reading women in horror, just Keep supporting the whole horror community. We're good people. 